So I just want to give my very last thanks, because this is the last time um, for me, my participation at least, to uh, all the people that participated in this grant, because in the end it took four years, I think, to, um, to start working on it from start to finish. That's when I started going to the EU library to conceive of some of these things. So it really started in 2009, which doesn't seem like it was four years ago, but oh my gosh, it was. So I want to thank again um, President Kelly, because he um, is an, one that really ultimately solicited me to, uh, to, to, to come down to the Graduate Center back in 1999-2000 when I had a broken foot after going to Cornell Law School for a week. And I couldn't believe that he insisted I come in anyway, and you know, I had to hobble down here. <laughs> and then I think it was in 2008 when Chase was here and I had another broken foot different foot, or one was an ankle, then the other was a foot. And he, and, and, uh, and again, I had to come in from New Jersey, and it was a little bit difficult with all the cast and everything, but he was wonderful in, in um, you know, bouncing ideas around and coming up with this idea, which is ultimately not about the Middle East, as Carol Gould has also mentioned, but it's, it's really about public intellectuals and political theorists and philosophers and social philosophers and all those things, studying um, the questions that are really juxtapositions. Um, and then I wanted to thank Richard. Richard Wollen actually has another event, so he couldn't be here today. And then, of course, Louise Linehan, the vice provost, because she was terrific, too, in bouncing a lot of ideas off. And then finally, um, a fair amount of the talks, or a number of the talks that I've been sponsoring have either been signed or are books for Princeton University Press series, The Public Square, um, which, again, I have to thank President uh, Kelly for allowing me to participate in that, because those used to be talks um, which were no longer talks, so I wanted to figure out a way to bring people in after the publication of the books, and this was one of them. And in addition to that, um, uh, today I just got the contract, I haven't signed it yet, but for another political series, and this series is a political theory series, and it's called Heretical Thought, the idea of heretics in thought. And one of the nicest things for me was that um, Martha Feynman, who when I introduce her, you will notice she, she has a great uh, book of a great subject, and she said not only do we, I know that she's a great public intellectual, but she said I want to be a heretic too. So <laughs> I thought that was, uh, that was just kind of a nice uh, moment here. So going to, um, to Martha Feynman, Martha Feynman I met in 1992, I think it was. I went to a Law and Society event, and I didn't really know who she was. Um, and, uh, but I was in a small group with her, and then it just became apparent, her amazing mind, and then um, I just couldn't believe all the different things she brought together for me, and that was back in 1992, and then I don't think I saw her again until an elevator, I think, at the American Political Science Association in, like, I don't know, 2000 or something like that, and that's when she insisted that I had to come and break my foot at Cornell, not really, but break my foot. <laughs> But uh, she, she was just um, absolutely wonderful. And then I started going to some of the, uh, the groups where she, I think she's one of these rare public intellectuals, professors, political theorists, legal theorists, um, just a, a, an amazing mind. And she started the Feminism and Legal Theory Project back in 1984. And I went to a couple of those, and that's actually where I met Liz Emmons and where I met a lot of different people because it's, a, it's just an absolutely amazing workshop, and it's pre-publication, and it's pre-even paper, because the idea is really that people who are interested in topics that have to do with difference um, and uh, really need to come together and help each other out as well. And then from that, she spun that off into another program called the Vulnerability, or it's not, it's not a, she didn't spin it off, it's a separate program called the Vulnerability and the Human Condition Initiative. And I have met so many people over the years that have come to me, too, in New York, um, to say, you know, that Martha has matched me up with, so to speak, um, that, uh, that I would never have known because of the different disciplines that they're in, as well as the different subjects that they're in, but she's kind of the nexus for all this amazing creative work. So Martha has been um, uh, not only a mentor to me, but an inspiration in terms of her counterintuitive, always controversial, but always successful research. So getting to her research, I, if I gave you the list of, I'll give you a few of the honors that she's won. It's so long that it's longer than any list of awards I've ever seen, but it includes like the Mary, uh, well, and I, uh, the Curry Fellowship from UCD School of Social Justice to the Ann Hirsch Centennial Lecture of the New England School of Law to Ruth Bader Ginsburg Distinguished Visiting Professorship at Thomas Jefferson Law School. It goes on and on and on. And so, and there are a couple things that you should note, and that's what she was on the executive committee of the Law and Society Association, which is a very important association, and I'm not even sure of the date that it started, but in bringing inter and intra discipline, interdisciplinary work really to um, the scene in the 1970s or 60s, 60s, so, or before that. The very, very important in terms of stimulating other research. 
In terms of her own book, she's authored four books, The Vulnerable Subject, the Vulnerable Subject Anchoring Equality and the Human Condition, which is forthcoming with Princeton in the public square, The Autonomy Myth, A Theory of Dependency, which was published with the New Press, The Neutered Mother, The Sexual Family, and Other 20th Century Tragedies with Routledge Press, and that book I put on required reading for quite a lot of subjects, and I always have told her, love to teach it because everybody gets it wrong, but I love trying to read, you know, kind of configure it because it's not wrong in my mind. And then a, a very important path-breaking book, The Illusion of Equality, The Rhetoric and Reality of Divorce Reform. She's also a book series editor and a cont contributor to another eight books, and many of them have become important books in terms of book, in terms of classes, Transcending the Boundaries of Law, Generations of Feminism and Legal Theory, What is Right for Children, The Competing Paradigms, Religion, and International Human Rights, Feminist and Queer Legal Theory, Feminism Confronts Homeo Economists, Feminism and the Media, Mothers in Law, Feminism and the, regulation, the Legal Regulation of Motherhood, the Public Nature of Private Violence, and At the Boundaries of Law, Feminism, and Legal Theory. In addition to our books being very theoretical or you know, breaking paths, myself, when I got divorced, I realized how revelatory her work was, in not just in the theoretical perspective, but actually in the practical forum. So then I had to call Martha back up again and say, wow, I'm not just you know, intellectually you know, uh, love this work, but at the same time, you got it so right in terms of the practice, because we're not often able to see that ourselves the, the, the nexus of, you know, law and practice or theory and ideas. So I was just stunned by that. In any case, today she's going to speak, um, and, uh, and, I, and of course, now I forgot the title of the talk. <laughs> Maybe you could give me the... I don't remember. Anymore. Okay. So she's going to speak on... Uh, does anyone have the title in front of them? Masculinities, the feminine, and multiple identity, and, and multiple identities. I did read it, and it's absolutely riveting reading. So, thank you, Martha, for coming. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. I know this time in the semester, it's uh, everybody's busy with other sorts of things. Um, I did bring uh, some material to hand out. One is, uh, and they're both up here. One is uh, describes the Emory Vulnerability in the Human Condition Initiative, and as part of this we have uh, visiting scholars, and the visiting scholars are quite often graduate students um, or professors. They come from around the world uh, to learn about the vulnerability project. This also has some um, definitions on it. So uh, take one if you're interested, and if you're interested in coming as a visiting scholar, we'd, um, we'd love to have you come and explore vulnerability, which we are uh, developing as an alternative to human rights, uh, the human rights paradigm. Um, and it it's now has satellite projects around the world. Um, the other thing I brought for you uh, is uh, uh, the newsletter, the most recent newsletter from the Feminism and Legal Theory Project, which just describes what the Feminism and Legal Theory Project's been up to, but also what the vulnerability in the human initiative has been up to uh, recently. And one of the things, uh, I actually have three books coming out this year, three collections, and one deals with uh, masculinities, and um, it's an uh, uncomfortable conversation about masculinities. And that's really what I'm going to be talking about uh, today, is, is that project, although this is part of a larger project, which really does deal with vulnerability and the human condition, and the question of how we anchor concepts of equality uh, in the human condition, rather than in abstract notions of, of rights. <clears throat> so, uh, some masculinity scholars argue uh, that feminists must take up the study of masculinity's uh, identity. Uh, feminist legal, legal scholars in particular are admonished to explore men's experiences with women from the men's perspective rather than only considering women's experiences from uh, women's perspectives. We are told that men's relationships and interactions with other men affect the ways in which they express their masculinities, and that, that expression of masculinity, as we are told, is an interactive process that has significant implications for how men interact with women. And this is one of the reasons feminists should care about this. There seems to be two distinct ways in which men are differentiated from each other and then strewn along a hierarchical continuum of masculinities. Um, so first, it's asserted that there, there is something called a hemogenic masculinity in operation. 
And uh, this masculinity is constructed in such a way that it's a status that few, if any men, actually are able to achieve. Uh, every man is always in a struggle uh, uh, to attain um, this form of masculinity, but this status is never arrived at in any stable form, and it must be constantly defended. Masculinity must be constantly defended. Um, since heterosexuality is central in achieving masculinity in this regard, uh, individual men must be very vigilant to act in ways that reinforces the fact that they are neither gay nor are they a woman or, more accurately, a woman-like. So in this rendering, all men are subordinate, although the subordination is to an ideal of masculinity uh, rather than to some other defined group in society, but all men are subordinated. Uh, in, ad in addition to this general, generalized subordination, some subset of men are seen to be in a position of relatively fixed or stable subordination uh, due to the fact that masculinity is also raced and classed. The argument in this regard is that men have certain characteristics, or some men have certain characteristics, uh, that are deemed incompatible with masculinity, uh, and that they can be further subordinated because of the way in which those characteristics interact with their masculinity. Um, this line of argument, as well as the observation about the centrality of heterosexuality, uh, reflects the, and parallels uh, some other identity-focused criticisms of feminist legal theory. So um, this project, this particular paper looks at masculinity theory, but this is also true with other uh, critiques of feminist legal theory as essentialist in nature, uh, as collapsing distinctions and differences uh, among women, for example, or in this context, um, among men. <clears throat> Individual men should be seen not only as men, but also seen as uh, situated along axes of interacting hierarchies of race and class in particular, and perhaps also ability, ethnicity, age, or religion. Therefore, it's important, we're told, to distinguish among men and to look at the ways in which different men are both differently subordinated and differently privileged within dominant cultural, legal, and socially imposed understandings of masculinity. Now, most masculinity scholars, at least the ones that I've read, concede that men as a group remain relatively privileged and that patriarchal privilege continues to matter in social, political, and economic relations. Uh, what these scholars seek is that men not be treated as an undifferentiated monolithic group. So that's essentially what the argument uh, is. <clears throat> now, some proponents of feminist legal scho uh, scholarship have actually taken up this challenge from masculinity scholars and masculinity cr critiques. Um, for example, Nancy Dowd uses the insights from masculinity theories uh, in examining the situation of boys, uh, and she does this in the context of education, and she also does it in the context of juvenile justice, the juvenile justice systems. Uh, she also looks at men in regard to fatherhood and also in regard to uh, the whole process surrounding sexual abuse. Um, using this approach in the educational context, uh, Dowd concludes that education, while it is expressly and formally gender neutral, so it's a gender neutral system, the structure, cultural, and norms that are in operation within the system are in fact gendered, even though the language is gender neutral, and often work against the interests of both boys and girls, although, although it acts against their interests differently, so the, you know, the manifestation stations are different. Um, by contrast, uh, the juvenile justice system, she tells us, has been designed primarily with boys in mind, or at least a version of boyhood that is criminalized, so these criminalized boy in mind. Uh, and, this, and this, as a result of this, it fails to meet the needs of girls who enter the system, uh, in, in, interestingly, increasingly, a large numbers of girls entering the system. Um, <clears throat> ironically, this system also fails the boys around whom it was designed, so it fails both boys and girls. Um, in regard to the position of men, the allegation is that fatherhood is an inherently male-identified role, but the specifically gendered nature of fatherhood ha has yet to be explored by feminist legal theorists, so they just, you know, undifferentiated fatherhood. 
Uh, in regard to sexual abuse, the charge is that feminist legal theories approach uh, typically calls to mind a male stranger and a female victim, while the reality is that men are also victims, women are also abusers, and quite often the, abusive, um, the, the abuser is a family member or a person who's in a close relationship uh, with the victim. Now, Dowd argues that a masculinity's approach calls attention to or, quote, exposes uh, male gender, gendering. Uh, she challenges us to think of boys and girls, men and women, complexly and simultaneously as in relation to each other rather than as discrete independent subjects. And again, this is a challenge in particular for feminist legal uh, theorists. Um, Dowd concedes that there's some danger that women might be excluded or marginalized in an analysis that also encompasses and pays particular attention to the position of men. Um, typ men typically have more societal power and privilege uh, than women, as we, as we know, uh, but she admonishes us to take not an either-or, but a both-and perspective, so not to, to put one in... Uh, in the shadow of the other. Uh, and uh, she ultimately argues that we should focus on institutional arrangements and relationships within this kind of gender uh, relationship. And she hopes that this might lessen the danger of excessively male-focused analyses. Uh, that she thinks that men's experience, bringing men's experience, will show the true scope and nature of the harms under patriarchy, harms that are universal, although they do remain gendered, shared by men and women, even if also differently experienced, but patriarchy hurt, hurts us all. Now, Dowd's attempt to point out distortions and inadequacies of the functioning of institutions using this kind of multiplicity of identity, complexity of subject approach, I think is very admirable. Uh, however, for me, her efforts, in particular the, this book that I'm talking about, uh, also points out the limitations of an identity approach. I uh, hear an identity approach that's based on gender and making gender more complex. Um, using identities inevitably brings the inquiry back to a search for specific targeted discrimination, a discrimination that is based on these identities. And when we talk about discrimination, it leads to an individual comparative project. Uh, and this in comparative project among individuals is actually inevitable in a discrimination analysis. Institutional and structural inequalities that are not or are no longer based on intentional, impermissible discrimination, uh, escape scrutiny, and certainly escape remedy. Further, Dowd concedes that making multiple identities central to the analysis will be difficult to do in practice. So even though we can talk about it theoretically, uh, doing it in practice when we're looking at uh, specific reforms, for example. Uh, further, that it's, uh, doing this may actually further uh, obscure some problems, uh, problems that can't be captured again by uh, this discrimination paradigm. She also concedes that it's difficult to both hold multiplicities in mind and not privilege one over another, so that when we have multiple identities in play, quite often what we do is to think, at least, that uh, one is more important or more salient than the other. Um, most interesting from my perspective, however, is the fact that her book contains a very few concrete suggestions for engagement with law and law reform. And it seems more directed at giving guidance for the reform of feminist legal scholarship. So her criticism is less focused on legal systems and legal practice than it is on feminist legal theory and feminist legal uh, theorists. Um, but my major concern with the book, and actually with the masculinity's approach, the way that she articulates it, is the way that it focus, uh, the focus on identities can actually narrow or constrict the critical imagination. And this is the big point. For example, in focusing on the gendered categories of mother and father, uh, as Dowd urges, we may fail to see and criti critically explore the institution of the family that contains those roles and the family's role in the larger society. So looking at the examples, the four examples that she uses um, to show how masculinities can open up issues. So remember, these are her, this is how masculinities can open up uh, issues. 
Um, I would ask very different questions and questions that really go beyond the gendered lens with which she approaches these issues. For example, why isn't the fact that we routinely incarcerate children regardless of their gender, the issue, and not the fact that incarcerated boys and girls are differently disadvantaged in a system that treats everyone inhumanly. All right, why is that the issue? Also, isn't the most pressing question in regard to the education of children the lack of resources for public schools, the overcrowding and other problems that have resulted from significant ideological shifts in the United States around the issue and the effect of privatization? The whole idea of public education is under attack, not because it is failing boys and girls differently, but because increasingly politicians and powerful interests assert that government should not be in the business of providing education. And we see this all over the place. In regard to men, Parenting isn't the real crux of the dilemma, not that fatherhood uh, is, dif is differently gendered, but that both genders have been shaped by the fact that dependency is perceived as primarily the responsibility of a private family. And this privatization of dependency within the family necessitates role division or some division of labor as between wage earner and caretaker. Now, historically, this role division was gendered, but the social disadvantages that are attached to the role or status of caretaker are not based on the sex of the person performing the care, but on the incompatibility of care work with the way that our market institutions are structured. What is needed is not more gender equality in law, as a gendered approach might tell us, but a theory to urge a more responsive state and accommodation in workplace policies. Similarly, uh, the extent and nature of child abuse in all its forms would not, in my opinion, look not only and compare abusive fathers with abusive mothers and look at their behavior, but would begin actually with a critique of the condoning effects of religious and cultural premises. The premises that say that such a abuse begins with the notion that parents own their children and have not only a right but a duty to discipline them. The legal manifestation of what I call state abandonment of responsibility for children is found in the extensive parental rights doctrines that shape policy in regard to education, custody and divorce, as well as other issues of law, since so it's con consistent with the, uh, what happens in the abuse context. Also, uh, on a very more personal level, I suppose, the masculinity's critique, as well as other identity-based critiques of feminist legal theory, uh, raises for me a question with which I have grappled my entire academic career, and that is the question of should feminist legal theorists give up on the possibility that the law can be used to advocate a positive social justice and equality project? Uh, should we give up because the legal categories we are compelled to use are inevitably uh, imperfect? Perhaps feminist legal theorists should confine ourselves to criticism as outsiders, to the deconstruction of legal categories and the ferreting out of situations not addressed or interests seemingly ignored and abandon the idea of constructive legal reform. Of course, a great deal would have been lost if feminist legal theorists had abandoned reform aspirations in the past. Femi feminist legal theory brought into existence into existence, innovations in legal thought, and generated substantive changes in the way that gender is addressed in law. Using the now sometimes vilified category of woman, feminists in law use gender equality as the concept with which to suggest reforms of significant sites of inequality. And here I include uh, sites of inequality such as the workplace, the family, and the public sphere. Reforms in those areas benefited many women across their differences and even some men in spite of their gender differences. In fact, when legal feminists entered the field, the categories of woman and man were defined as different and contrasted with one another in laws that structured many of society's institutions. So women and men were treated very differently in law. 
One could even say, historically, the law actually recognized two distinct legal subjects, a male legal subject and a female legal subject. The early objective of uh, legal feminism was to challenge those differences and those different institutional and identity constructs. Uh, and these uh, constructs, gendered constructs, tended to disadvantage and justify the exclusion of women as a legally defined group. So feminist legal theories imagined utopian, gender neutral, and egalitarian inclusive visions for society and law. They used concepts reflecting gendered institutional arrangements in society and created legal issues and claims uh, around such things as care work. Care work was to be valued equally with paid work. Also the idea of marital property. Marital property recognized there were different but equally important forms of contribution to the accumulation of wealth and property. Prior to this, the idea he who earns it owns it, uh, was it now, now marital property says different contributions but of equal value. These concepts were brought uh, into mainstream legal and political discourse and made the basis for legal reforms. Feminist legal theorists also created uh, legal harms from what had been invisible gendered experiences for many women, uh, discovering things like domestic violence and marital rape, for example. They toppled the common law concept of husbands as disciplinarians and heads of households in favor of a partnership model of marriage. The idea of using law to get at such inequalities is hard to abandon, at least for feminist scholarships of that, which is my uh, generation. And for me, <clears throat> there are significant questions about the wisdom of fragmenting the legal subject along multiple axes of identity <coughs> characteristics if we want to continue to use law to develop a reconstructive social justice project. In fact, it could be argued that the turn to multiplicities of identity uh, actually worked to derail a, a beginning social justice project uh, during the 1960s and 70s, um, fragmenting identities that may have contributed to shattering old alliances, impeded the formation of broad and effective uh, new coalitions. Differences can be used to divide groups who might otherwise come together in the interest of working toward greater social justice. But perhaps most harmful, at least in my perspective, uh, to a broadly conceived and inclusive social justice project is the way in which identity categories have become proxies through which we articulate and understand social inequalities such as poverty and other forms of social disadvantage that transcend those categories. Attribution of socially produced disadvantage to the mistreatment of only some groups, and this is again the discrimination model, detracts from the development of a systemic analysis uh, that bro of broadly unequal political and economic organization of our society. It obscures the way in which subordination and inequalities are generated and shared across identities. Equally problematic is the way in which identity-focused analysis tends to concentrate attention on identifying innocent or worthy victims and also generally is premised on the assumption that there are or have been in the recent past, past individual or institutional villains. So we need innocence and villainy. <clears throat> this assumption is often difficult to prove and many people, including judges and juries, go to great lengths to find reasons other than discrimination for behavior. Uh, they focus on the plaintiff's conduct, for example, or attitude, rather than on the conduct of the defendants. And you see this uh, discrimination cases are, in fact, the least successful <clears throat> successful cases that are litigated. And even though those who uh, prevail in litigation are overturned at a higher rate on appeal so that there are, the legal system is very unsuccessful in regard to using discrimination to actually affect social change. <clears throat> I think it is uh, relevant that masculinities theory was not uh, initially developed by legal theorists, but evolved first in other disciplines, uh, and this is specifically those of sociology and psychology. There are significant differences between a legal approach and that of a discipline like psychology or sociology. The subject and object of analysis are different, as are the focus and methodology. 
The disciplines ask different questions and are concerned with different norms uh, and goals. Uh, now, this does not mean that those disciplines are irrelevant to law or that theorists in other areas cannot use law within their disciplines. Rather, it merely means, uh, or is merely a reminder, that the legal subject is an artifact that is constructed uh, by and through law. It is constructed in part to hide the various and varying realities of persons of flesh and blood. <laughs> It wants to confine those persons, those individuals, within the roles that they are assigned in and through law. So the whole purpose of law is to actually obscure differences. Note that the actual legal subject at issue uh, actually need not even be a real person. As we know, it can be a corporation or an association, and this is what Citizens United and Mitt Romney told us. Corporations are, in fact, people, so we protect them. They're legal persons. Also significant is the fact that the relationship between social science disciplines and institutions of state power are different than are those of law. Of course, theorists from those areas <clears throat> can play a role in court proceedings as expert witnesses, and their scholarship is used uh, by legal theorists and in legal contexts. But legal scholarship directly and differently engages with state institutions, institutions that can and do exercise considerable power and influence over people's lives. Lawyers as judges, legislators, or even professors sometimes um, act as experts and insiders to the legal system as they generate, explicate, manipulate, and critique norms, rules, and systems that punish and reward certain behaviors in law. The disciplining nature and force of legal scholarship on an individual or institution is different more immediate, focused, and more likely to have a direct impact on structuring people's lives than is social, sociological or historical research. Further, there are unique characteristics associated with law and its uses that affect the legal system ability to incorporate the kind of uh, generalized uh, insights about differences that we see in some identity scholarship, uh, be it race or sex-based or found in hierarchies of masculinity. So the tools that are available to legal scholars are limited in some important ways by the nature of legal institutions, the nature of law itself, and the constraining norms and values of legal scholarship. Now to talk about this in terms of limitation is not to disparage law and legal method. We would not want law to be too individualized, allow too much discretion, or arbitrary or uh, idiosyncratic applications of law. In fact, the, the quotation that we are, a nation, we are a nation of laws and not men reflects this resistance to the idea that we can have lots of different rules for lots of different uh, people. Appropriately, when dealing with power, law making relies on classifications, the generalization of broad the generation of broad generalizations about individuals, groups, or classes of things or people. This classification process occurs initially at the constitutional and legislative levels, where systems of rules and norms are, that are intended to have universal application are generated through uh, and within categories, so that we have that first level. Generalizations and aggregations are inevitable in this process, and once the categories are drawn, the foundational principle of equality before the law demands that the same treatment be applied to those who fit within the same classifications. In other words, the legal and political subject, as we conceive it in the United States, is a universal subject, and it must be. Individuals may be sexed, raced, and classed, but the whole point of equal protection of the law is to erase differences in treatment within those classifications or categories. By contrast, adjudication uh, is the means whereby individual circumstances are fitted into existing classifications. Adjudication is the process whereby individual and specific facts are assigned legal meaning or consequences on a case-by-case -case basis. But adjudication is not an ad hoc, ad hoc process either, and the same mandate of equal treatment applies. Courts make decisions using analogies and making distinctions within the context of rules such as those governing precedent and stare decisis. So we're supposed to treat like cases alike. 
Ideally, um, ideally at least, this web of consistent, coherent, and predictable doctrine is based on the use of classification. In other words, legal classifications are of necessity broad and take the legal subjects outside of personal history, universalizing what might appear as inherently different to scholars in other disciplines. In order to speak to law, legal theory, even when it's of the feminist variety, must to some extent assimilate concrete and material differences into the dominant meta-narrative of law. As a result, legal theory will have only a limited ability to theorize around particulars. Uh, this reflects the reality that operating in society as a dominant paradigm in discourse, law both co-ops the experience of diverse groups while also homogenizing and standardizing those experiences as they are specifically subjected to law. Co-optation is achieved through this classification process and addressed typically by tinkering reforms. Standardization operates upon individuals, individuals who are caught in legal constructs, such as the adversarial process, rules of evidence, and structured elements of causes of action and claims for relief. All of this makes it difficult, if not impossible, to tell specific legal stories outside of established legal narratives. Now, many years ago, in thinking about imperfections of existing gendered classifications in law, I referred to motherhood as a, quote, colonized category. Uh, what I meant by that was that motherhood was a category that was occupied exclusively by women, but given legal meaning and content in institutions that were predominantly populated by men. I now realize, several decades later, <laughs> that perhaps, uh, if not most, if not all, legal categories are colonized to, uh, to a large extent. And this is true with gendered categories that affect men, uh, as it is with those that, are affect, that affect women. Colonization is inherent in the classification process, and classification is essential to the operation of the legal system. But the fact that, o that broad, over, and under-inclusive classifications are inev inevitable does not mean that the resulting categories, imperfect as they may be, cannot be employed effectively uh, to affect positive change. So we can still use those categories, uh, even though they're imperfect. Nor does it mean that the interpretation and content of legal categories are not worth fighting over. They certainly are. In fact, motherhood is a good example of a legal category, colonized category, that we did fight over and managed to significantly change the content of that. Which brings me back, of course, to my dilemma, uh, and that is what role for feminist legal theory in affecting change. Uh, certainly one way out of, uh, from under the criticism and accusations of essentialism that come from masculinity scholars and others uh, in regard to understanding what women are and feminist, feminism is, is for feminist legal theories to give up on the possibility of the positive uses of law. Perhaps pursue cultural and political engagements outside of formal institutions. Although I, I must say I wonder what political, what end for political engagement if it doesn't eventually get worked into law? I just wonder about that. But anyway, um, this is uh, the direction that some feminist legal theorists are taking. Uh, Janet Halley, in particular, has argued that feminists should turn away from uh, law, uh, borrowing from Foucault's model of diffuse power. She asserts that any attempt to productively engage law will simply extend the reach of regulation, administration, and discipline. In this analysis, law cannot be redeemed, and trying to transform or reform law poses risks of co-optation and marginalization. Uh, provocatively, she couples this move away from law with a call to take a break from feminism. Uh, this is justified, this break is justified, because of the way that legal feminism has produced a legal subjectivity for women that's associated with experiences of oppression and or victimization. Uh, the status of victim is assumed to hold true for all of those falling within the legal category of women. Um, I, I have already conceded that this in fact happens as a result uh, of the fact that law can and does generate norms, rules, and rationalizations uh, that are outside of and above lived daily experiences. So not all women experience the legal manifestation 
of oppression, but, it, uh, but some do, some don't. Um, this is a result, again, of the co-opting, standardizing nature of lingual institutions, which I argue is really inevitable. Uh, but I think that this presents a paradox, this whole notion, what Haley does, arguing we should uh, give up on law, turn away from law, presents a paradox, I think, for the critical legal theorist, uh, not a directive for disengagement, which is how she understands this notion of co-optation of, of the legal category. Um, but when I encountered this call to turn around for, uh, away from law, I must consider the reality, or at least my reality, that law is everywhere. Law is found not only in statutes, cases, courts, and legislatures, but actually spills over and permeates the daily life of individuals, entities, and institutions, and relationships. In other words, critical legal scholarship must confront the fact that inevitably legal classifications homogenize distinct individual experiences into some overarching whole, but also recognize that law in society and through its institutions creates and profoundly shapes both individual and institutional experiences. We cannot stand outside of law any more than we can stand outside of culture. For a feminist legal scholar, this means that we must engage with law, that it is a political, ethical, and moral imperative that we engage with law. Recognizing that legal categories or classifications have real world consequences in people's lives mandates that there be political struggles over their meanings and applications. And these struggles reflect both a legal and a political process, one that must take place within a pragmatic system uh, that uh, recognizes lines must be drawn and decisions must be made regardless of the incomplete or emerging nature of the underlying facts or theories. No, for me, <clears throat> this has resulted um, in, a, in my current project, was, which is reimagining the legal subject. And in doing this, I argue uh, that we begin to think about the legal subject um, is, as a, begin to think about the concept of a legal subject in a flexible, powerful way that's ena that enables us to take into account a variety of different circumstances. Um, I argue uh, particularly that we must move beyond the one-dimensional and very impoverished legal subject of Locke and liberal thought uh, with its pr uh, privileging of um, characteristics such as autonomy and independence, so move away from that liberal subject. Um, Ideally, uh, uh, perspective scholars or identity scholars also want to do this. Uh, they want to do this moving away from the universal liberal legal subject. Uh, they want to do this by um, the, uh, introducing the ideas of intersectionality and asking us to recognize multiplicities of identities. Um, that I think, I think that we have to move in exactly the opposite direction away from the fragmentation of the legal subject to the creation of a vigorous universal conception that will bring under consideration not the differences among individuals, but the basic sameness, as well as focusing us on uh, the relationship between the individual, the state, and societal institutions, and <coughs> raising questions about the allocation of responsibility for uh, the realities of the human condition. And so to this end, in recent work, I have developed this idea of the vulnerable subject. And the vulnerable subject is a universal subject to replace this one-dimensional, deformed, liberal subject uh, that has been used to render um, uh, pathological and deviant uh, what are really natural and inevitable relationships of dependency, need, and vulnerability. Um, and I'm just going to tell you the two things that led to that, and I'm going to turn it over to Liz because I want to give time for discussion. Um, the, the concept of the vulnerable subject, which again is a universal subject, and vulnerability is constant in the human condition. None of us escape vulnerability. Uh, we can gain resilience through social institutions which give us resources with which to confront misfortune and also to take advantage of opportunities as they present themselves in our lives. Uh, but none of us can escape vulnerability. 
Uh, the concept arose, or my approach to it, arose from asking two fundamental questions. The first one was, what should be the political and legal implications of the fact that we are embodied beings, which mean that we are born, live, and die within a fragile materiality that renders all of us constantly susceptible to destructive external forces and internal disintegration. Second question, if bodily needs and the messy dependency that they carry cannot be ignored in our lives, how can they be absent in our theories about society, our theories about justice, uh, politics, uh, and law? The liberal legal subject at best captures only one stage, the least uh, likely to be vulnerable of the, in the human condition. Uh, the life course, the idea of a life course encapsulated in the vulnerable subject recognizes that during the course of our lives, individuals encounter a, a wealth of possible opportunities, frustrations, challenges, experiences, and that this necessitates a wide range of differing and interactive abilities. Uh, so we have all of this that goes on in, in our lives. Importantly, again, no one stands outside uh, of vulnerability. There is no position of invulnerability. There is only resilience, <clears throat> the resources that allow us to respond. And no one is born with resilience. Resilience is something that we gain in interaction within society and its institutions. And it's the role of those institutions in providing resilience that I argue provides the basis for the claim that what we need is a reactive and responsive state, a state that's shaped in response to our um, universal vulnerability. All right, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very, very much, Martha. That was very, it was fascinating as always. Um, uh, so now let me just quickly introduce Elizabeth Lamons. Uh, she's coming down here today from, um, from Columbia Law School. And she's taught um, many different places, including Hebrew University. I guess you haven't taught many different places, but, you, but like many law professors, she's gone around the world to some extent. Or I look at these Vitas, and it's very nice. So you were last at also Hebrew University here for the summer, I guess. Uh, but I met Liz um, through some of my disability work, I think at a workshop for, with Martha, right? Is that right? And, uh, and so she's, she's universalizing and, and making uh, the idea of bodies uh, universal in a lot of her work. And she has a book coming out, Disability Law and Theory, with Michael Sign, um, which looks very exciting. And she has a major academic article such as Compulsory Sexuality, Disabling Attitudes, Framing Disability, Regulatory Fictions, Intimate Discrimination, Integrating Accommodation, Changing Name, Changing, Framing Rules in the Future of Marital Names, The Sympathetic Discrimination, Mental Illness, Hedonic Casts, and the ADA, Aggravating Youth, and Montgomery Law and Compulsory Monogamy and Polyamorous Existence. I found um, that work uh, very fascinating, uh, and so thank you very much for coming and giving us a nice commentary. So it's a tremendous honor um, to comment on Martha Feynman, uh, whose work has been defining for, for legal feminists and feminists more generally uh, for several decades. Uh, she is that rare combination in that uh, she is a thinker who's prominently associated with, with one of her ideas. Um, she's in a sense a, a brand name in that she is always um, a citation uh, for a particular proposition uh, foundational to and generative of uh, so much feminist and queer scholarship. Um, the proposition that our legal system gets it entirely wrong to organize legal recognition and support uh, around horizontal conjugal relationships um, when what the state should really care about um, and support is dyadic relations of care. Now, this can be a, a complicated, Martha would complicate this and, and no doubt tell me that that, that encapsulation um, doesn't quite do it. Um, but uh, this is an idea that um, is forever associated with Martha Feynman. Um, uh, she's sort of the, the Kleenex or the Xerox of, of, of that idea, um, if you will, um, uh, of, a, of a whole family, for a whole family of ideas, in a sense, because of her crucial foundational role um, uh, in that um, discourse. Now, that in itself is rare and impressive in a scholar, right, that you, you get an idea associated so deeply with your, your name that you will always appear uh, as the citation uh, for it. Um, but what makes 
uh, Martha Feynman truly exceptional is that she's not only the name prominently associated with one particular idea, but that she is not in any sense just rested on that one idea. She's continued to generate new ideas and to publish important work pushing the envelope uh, further um, in not unrelated uh, and yet novel directions. So in the spirit of um, uh, uncomfortable conversations, um, uh, today I'm going to do two unconventional things in these remarks. Um, first, I will admit to finding Martha's central argument about the vulnerable subject to be compelling. Um, the proposition that the universal subject of the state is a vulnerable one uh, and that we should rethink uh, all of our uh, laws um, through that lens is, in my view, uh, essentially irrefutable, though you may disagree. Um, what legal solutions we may devise in response may well differ, but the project that Martha calls for uh, is without question, in my view, necessary, uh, right, and deeply pressing. I call this an unconventional, unconventional way to begin my response um, because it seems to me that the convention for commentator, commentati, commentators, commentating of this sort uh, is to take on the principal thesis as if one's role as commentator, perhaps one's dignity as, as commentator, uh, requires it. Um, uh, but rather than attempt to dislodge or take apart her argument, um, I'm going to proceed with a series of questions related to the paper, which will invite Martha uh, and the audience to engage further uh, with these ideas. Um, at times, um, I'll be inviting Martha to say more about a topic she has only touched on here, but has written about in greater depth elsewhere. Now, this in itself is quite usual, right? A series of questions in response. But my frame for these questions will be, uh, I think, unusual. It's common for commentators to give commentary of the following sort. Why aren't you writing about what I'm interested in? Why don't you write about this other topic, which I write about? Um, and of course, they rarely say this in this way, right? They mask their solipsism in authority, presenting whatever they are interested in as the important subject, which for some inexplicable reason the speaker or writer has failed uh, to address. Instead, I'm actually going to own my obsessions, um, and I'm going to frame my questions in the nature of requests for advice uh, or guidance, and how I can take Martha's insights uh, presented here and use them to push, push my own projects uh, to the next uh, level. Um, I should add that it's also a special pleasure to speak in an event hosted by, by Ruth O'Brien, um, who's been presenting us with challenging ideas uh, uh, also for over two decades, including in one of my own fields, disability law, as she mentioned uh, before, where her bodies in revolt in particular um, importantly influenced uh, my work on uh, disability accommodations, uh, which I'll mention in a moment. And I first met them both, I think, at the same conference. I think I actually have a vision of the two of you talking in the hotel lobby um, in Emory at this uncomfortable conversation uh, that Martha uh, was hosting as part of her amazing series by that name uh, on disability law. I think it was in 2003, maybe. Um, and as, an, as a new sort of almost uh, law professor, these interactions with, with both Ruth uh, and uh, Martha um, uh, influenced me greatly. Um, so I'm delighted to get to have this opportunity to bring my obsessions um, here uh, before you uh, and ask uh, how you might um, respond to them in light of what you're thinking about. So my questions center on the following four topics. Uh, first, the specialness of masculinity. Uh, second, the potential for new identities. Three, the possibilities in disability law. And four, the mechanism for changing minds. Now, in a sense, uh, these walk through four stages or aspects of my work. Uh, and um, so I will be asking you um, just what I would most like to ask you, in a sense, if we were sitting down to tea with or without an audience. Um, and in this way, I mean to acknowledge that your work actually makes me very uncomfortable um, in the ways that it challenges me to confront serious uh, challenges to my own work. Um, and so in the nature of an uncomfortable conversation, uh, I'll bring that discomfort uh, to the fore. <laughs> and I hope you'll indulge me by responding at the beginning, which I understand um, from Adam is um, uh, within bounds for this forum. So first, my first set of uh, questions concerns the specialness of masculinity. So Martha, you opened this paper with a discussion of the problem of masculinity scholarship. 
Uh, my PhD dissertation was, in a sense, a study in masculinities. Uh, I wrote about rhetoric uh, surrounding sexuality and reputation uh, in the writings by and about a late 18th, early 19th century uh, British uh, writer, William Beckford, uh, who was also a notorious alleged sodomite. Um, and I included in my dissertation a kind of apology early on uh, for the inattention to women. Um, uh, writing that we could, however, I thought, learn about women from studying men, um, but following Eve Sedgwick, I said we couldn't really know in advance how much the two stories would converge, um, but we could assume that they would in some ways. Here you use one vein of masculinity scholarship, that which critiques the essentialism of feminist theory as emblematic of the problems of identity-based critiques of feminism. Um, and my question is, is there anything uniquely problematic or uniquely productive about masculinities scholarship per se, independent of the broader problems with identity-based and anti-essentialist critiques of feminism more generally? Um, approached differently, I might ask, what should someone very interested in masculinities use this field to ask? Um, is there something special that can be gained from the study of, say, vulnerability in the context of masculinity in terms of the ways that you think about uh, that project? Um, and can any of that work contribute uh, uh, to your project, or is it oblique? Is it oblique perhaps in the same ways that I think you deem uh, psychological inquiry um, to be oblique? My second set of questions centers on the potential for new identities, um, and it relates to my first legal project, um, which Ruth mentioned was on uh, polyamory um, or multi-party relationships, and my most recent legal project, or, or one of them, which is on the emerging identity category of asexuality, um, or people who define themselves uh, around a lack of sexual attraction to others. I conclude the asexuality paper by looking at asexuality's fit with existing anti-discrimination law, trying to understand that field of law by looking at why people seem to assume asexuality doesn't really fit very well with it. Now, I admit that this is certainly not the only question one could ask about asexuality. Um, and in fact, I ask many other questions throughout the paper, including in a part dedicated to unearthing the sexual assumptions of our legal system more generally by looking at it through the lens of asexuality, where, not surprisingly, I cite Martha Feynman. Um, but here, um, I'm uncomfortable, uh, as I think that Martha might be troubled by the whole project of engaging so deeply with an emerging identity discourse in this way, leading it up to a discussion of anti-discrimination law uh, as, our, as the, the place where you put the pen down. Um, is that right? Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll be interested to hear you say why. Um, uh, I wonder what you think would be the most interesting question to ask about the rise of a new identity uh, formed uh, around um, uh, a lack of sexual attraction to others. But more broadly, um, I'm interested in the extent to which your project does still include a space for anti-discrimination law. I was surprised when I got to that point in the paper, um, and I don't think you said it as you were giving the, the shortened remarks, um, but after being quite critical of anti-discrimination law, um, you then say, right, there's still room for it alongside the analysis of institutions uh, and structures. Um, but I wonder, do you not see any tension between your first legal project um, uh, maintaining some anti-discrimination law protections, and your second, of looking at institutions uh, instead of individual relations. Is there a way that the anti-discrimination framework, you know, has a kind of giant sucking sound associated with it that kind of pulls everything into it and makes it hard um, to, to focus on institutions, as I think my colleague Susan Sturm, for instance, uh, has, has also found. So third, my third set of questions originates uh, in a project of mine that came out of the conference at Emory, where I first met the two of you. Um, the one I mentioned intersected uh, with Ruth's work. At that conference, I was presenting one project related to discrimination on the basis of psychiatric disability, but I had an aha moment uh, for another project. I was sitting in a talk in which the presenter had an overhead projector projecting an inscrutable diagram. Um, there were circles and lines and arrows, um, and the whole audience was sitting there kind of squinting at this diagram, trying to figure out at some, what point she was going to illuminate us all as to what this diagram was doing, because it was utterly meaningless just looking at it. When suddenly someone in the front row, who was obviously blind, raised their hand and said, could you please describe the diagram? And everyone sort of breathed a sigh of relief, except for the presenter, who then had to attempt to explain this inscrutable diagram. But um, it was, for me, a striking moment in seeing uh, 
one of the ways that accommodations provided for people with disabilities can benefit more people than the individual with a disability uh, who specifically requests uh, the accommodation. Um, and I wrote an article on that subject um, uh, related to some of Ruth's work. I, I was not the first one to make this point, certainly, but I was, so far as I know, the, the first one to point out how legal doctrine has systematically ignored these benefits, even while ostensibly doing a cost-benefit analysis of reasonable accommodations. My question for you, Martha, about your vulnerability work is this, you're, you're as I mentioned before, quite hard on anti-discrimination law. Um, is disability law and the legal right to accommodation something different from anti-discrimination law as you conceive it? As you describe anti-discrimination law throughout, it doesn't seem here to, to include right, um, the accommodation right. Um, or does still the accommodation framework, to the extent that it's always accommodation of something, um, have some of the fatal flaws or limits that you find in anti-discrimination law more generally? My final set of questions relates to a project I haven't yet written and don't know if I'll be able to write, but I'm fascinated by others' attempts. And this begins with my interest in the question of what kinds of contributions disability and disability studies can make to other fields of knowledge um, and other modes of being. Uh, that is, people usually think of disability as a, as a deficit, as something to feel bad about or sorry for. Uh, it seems to me, though, that disability is incredibly productive, uh, not just in terms of accommodations, as I mentioned before, or the ideas, uh, as well as law reforms around it, but even in terms of disability per se. Um, and one of the things I love about uh, Martha's work on vulnerability is it seems to me that it shows us um, one of the things that disability profoundly teaches us, right? It helps to, to show up uh, the myth of the autonomous subject. Uh, and this brings me to my question for you, Martha. Um, and I think of this uh, as akin to, in some ways, when you said the question that, that has plagued you for years. This is, in, in some sense, um, uh, one or the question that has plagued me for uh, some years, which is, in the time that you've been doing this important political and theoretical thinking, what do you think changes minds? Um, what brings about the aha moments for people in feminism, or about vulnerability. Um, I've proposed in one place that a person's own disability, right, can, can obviously do it, but thinking about becoming disabled, um, maybe. I, I think it's possible that thinking about one's partner or intimate relations becoming disabled actually has maybe more potential because it, it may, in some sense, be slightly less scary. It may have a, a little less of the, the um, existential uh, anxiety that um, uh, Harlan Hahn describes associated with it, and so maybe it's more possible for people to make an inroad through imagining someone close to them uh, becoming disabled. Um, but what do you think? What do you think changes hearts and minds, if, if anything? Now, this is in part a question about genre that takes us beyond law. Um, that is one of the things I think about a lot in my teaching, and I, I teach in an interdisciplinary way for this reason, and, and I know you both think about these questions, right? Literature or film, public protest, personal experience. Um, but can law, can and should law play a role in changing people's minds? Or should we not care so much about changing people's minds? Is something about as part of what law reform enables us to do is to escape that kind of psychological inquiry um, that I hear you two in part be uh, critiquing? Um, or, or is that uh, deeply uh, central uh, to the endeavor? So I look forward uh, to your further thoughts, Martha. Can you go to the mic again? Oh, okay. She want me to respond to this? If you can. Okay. I can always respond. Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't get to finish all of the what, what was in the paper, um, and I think that some of what I didn't get to um, might be relevant to what Liz had to say, which I appreciate your comments very much. Um, first of all, I'm, I never advocate moving away from, disabil uh, from dis um, discrimination. And in fact, I do argue that what we need to do is to... Um, is to strengthen a lot of our discrimination provisions. Um, but I am uh, not interested, actually, as a, uh, as a scholar right now in, um, in beefing up the discrimination project. And <clears throat> um, I had, what I, part I didn't get to was this looking at um, uh, the differences in, within vulnerability. So how would an identity-based analysis, someone who, who believes in identity, however, however it's defined, um, approach a vulnerability analysis. 
Um, the theory paradoxically argues that uh, while we must begin with the conception of, uh, of human vulnerability as universal, and this is really important for the political claims that are based on the theory, um, so that it's essential to this theory itself that we view this as an, a universal and constant part of the, um, of the human condition in order to fashion our political subject. On the individual or experiential level, vulnerability is realized in varied and unique ways. Um, and within this, so there is both universal um, in terms of making the claim, but when we understand it, we also have to understand it as particular. Um, there are two forms of individual difference that are relevant in the theory itself. Uh, the first form is the physical, mental, intellectual, and other variations in human embodiment. Um, this is where disabilities might come into play too. Um, and, and I recognize that those differences are not always socially neutral and they've been used for, you know, to uh, cre the creation of hierarchies, discrimination, and even violence. Um, and, um, I, in, in this part of the analysis also, I'm very critical of the idea of vulnerable populations, which you see quite often in some vulnerability scholarship. So they'll talk about vulnerable populations, uh, which I think obscures the reality of universal vulnerability and stigmatizes, uh, at the same time, stigmatizes the designated population. Uh, so the appropriate uh, legal response to variations in human uh, human uh, characteristics uh, is to, prove, to improve and strengthen anti-discrimination system, to have a complementary affirmative action program, uh, and also importantly to develop social welfare processes, processes that can make up for past discrimination when we're talking about some groups within society um, or lack of accommodation, and reduce the probability that discrimination or exclusion will occur in the future. So I think that's all a worthwhile project. It is not, however, right now my project. <laughs> Um, my practice is associated with the second form of difference that I think is really uh, central and not discussed. And this, is, this is, reveals me, I'm coming out as a structuralist here. Okay. The second form of relevant difference are the differences in social location uh, that are uh, importantly produced uh, as a result of institutional practices and operations. Um, while it's true that differences are manifested on an individual level, these institutional differences, um, it's the attention to the functioning of institutions which I think is the strength of a vulnerability analysis. So we are differently situated within webs of economic and institutional relationships, and those webs structure and create opportunities. They give us resilience. Um, all individuals are dependent on these institutions, be the institutions family, or market, or state, uh, because institutions provide the primary access and pathways to gain the resources that are necessary to address our vulnerability. Um, and again, this is, I think, uh, the, the a real strength of the vulnerability analysis is this attention to institutions. So societal institutions are theorized as having grown up around vulnerability. So it is our vulnerability and the realization of it that, for, that makes us reach out to form relationships, to form families, to form communities, to form societies and nation states, and also to form uh, international organizations. So this is in response to our vulnerability. Um, I've identified five different types of resource or assets, so, uh, kind of systems, uh, in, that in, the institutions that provide um, for us these resources or resilience. So there are uh, physical or material um, systems or, or institutions. There are human capital sorts of institutions that give us um, capabilities. Uh, there are social um, institutions, and these include things like the family. They also can include political organizations. And importantly, um, the, social, uh, <clears throat> the social resources can come from identity groups, such as our, our you know, identification across gender. So I don't say that that's not an important thing to do. It is. It's one of the things that gives us uh, resilience. Um, the fourth are ecological or environmental systems that can give us resilience and resources with which to deal with things. And I also include existential. Uh, systems and here I would talk uh, certainly about religion, but also uh, other systems of belief and aesthetics that again give us resist resources, give us resilience when we're dealing with the uncertainties or questions of why, why am I here and what am I doing. Um, 
But it's this link between these various types of resources and state responsibility, again, because it's through institutions, through our institutions and entities such as corporations, schools, workplaces, families, churches, uh, that these resources are delivered and all of these institutions are developed um, and um, uh, established and maintained as legitimate entities by law, by the state. Uh, so the state um, brings these institutions into being, uh, continues to monitor and maintain them, and of course the um, state must be vigilant in ensuring that their operation is in ways that are, that are consistent with public values such as justice and equality, uh, and to the extent that they're not. So this is how I try to counteract the idea of a restrained state, which is so in small government um, arguing that uh, the state is always a residual actor. The question is not whether the state will be um, active or not. The question is what standards will be, it will be held to uh, as it continues to interact and create and generate um, these institutions. So I think that um, the potential for new identities comes in that first form of difference, so it certainly can be accommodated within there. Uh, I, I argue that, in fact, our discrimination categories, current ones, are very, very narrow, things like race and gender, um, but I would definitely open that up and include more and more identities, so uh, that, that's certainly, certainly there. And I've argued for a long time that one of the problems with feminist theory um, is the centrality of sexuality to the way that we understand everything. So it's not only gender, but it's sexuality. So I'm glad, I'm great to, it's good to hear you're working on asexuality. So that's, that's terrific. Um, so new identities are, are terrific. Um, what do I think is a, a problematic or special about, or a, about masculinities? Um, I think it's good. When, in a vulnerability analysis, so looking at the institution of fatherhood, I wouldn't focus on gender. I would instead look at the societal institutions and the way that work is structured so that in order to be caring, attentive fathers, men have to give up a certain amount of you know, a career, building career capital, so that you look at their vulnerabilities within social institutions, not as men, but the, but the vulnerabilities that are created in the ways that these institutions are operating, maybe that would give us a way to think about how those institutions should be reformed. The way that we look about it, uh, at it now, with gender as central, uh, of course, is, ah, the solution for the work-family conflict is let's get men to share more in the responsibilities, in, you know, in, in household responsibilities. So uh, gender, when you, when you begin to look at these problems already with a framework that you're imposing on the situation, that's your answer to, right? I mean, that's what, oh, this is a problem of gender, why don't we have more gender equality, rather than looking at, again, at the institutional arrangements that make gender differentiation uh, uh, historically inevitable and increasingly, I mean, continually uh, inevitable given other sorts of things. So, um, what else? Uh, do I, th I think, the, the question about, about disability, um, I think that disability scholarship is really important to um, the, whole, the whole concept of vulnerability. And in the same way that um, disability has a stigmatized or negative, so does vulnerability. Although I think vulnerability really goes broader than just disability. In fact, it does away to some extent with the concept of disability, but certainly uh, relies on the process of accommodation. Again, it's the changing of these societal institutions that should be, um, that should be undertaken. Um, I also think of vulnerability, uh, although it has an implica implications for, um, for courts and, and judicial review, I really think of it as a legislative ethic. And when I think about how it is that you could actually structure a vulnerability pro uh, analysis into society, I look at things like um, the, the Commission on Children and Youth that exists in, uh, all f in, in throughout Great Britain, in, um, in Northern Ireland, in Wales, and in Scotland, as well as in England. And they're charged, uh, paid, by, paid for and created by the government, but independent from the government, charged with assessing every single uh, proposed legislation to look to see what are going to be the impacts of that legislation on children and youth. So when I think about what a legislative responsibility should be, 
or in how we should think about legislative ethics, it would be to have a process in place, and we do this incidentally with the Congressional Budget Office for Economics, and we do it in agencies when we talk about environmental impact statements for you know env agency environmental um, issues. But if we could actually structure into our process some sort of um, you know commission that with that actually fed into political debates, um, information from universities, from NGOs, from others about what the impacts of legislation are going to be, who's privileged and who's disadvantaged by specific things that are proposed. Imagine what kind of political discourse we might have if we had that process. That doesn't tell us how it's going to turn out, which is a political question, I and mean, we live in a democracy, um, but at least it changes the uh, basis of the discussion, and it would also uh, offer the opportunity for political organization around um, real consequences, so we wouldn't engage in these uh, incredibly partisan and, and uh, unproductive and actually destructive um, discussions that we tend to end up with so much now. So I don't know if that answered all your all your various points, but um, uh, uh, but anyway, so.